guest today is someone who has studied and lectured and, and written about various aspects of, of the European project for a long time now as a teacher in Oxford, in the London School of Economics, more recently in Harvard, and also as, as a writer of a, a series of books, some dealing specifically with the economics of European integration, and more recently with the, the politics and strategic issues. And his most recent book, which is out this year, is called In Defence of Europe, Can the European Project Be Saved? You came here in 2012 with colleagues from the Policy Network in London, Roger Little and Olaf Cram, and talked to us about the Eurozone. So we have a, there's a, a chain of, of contact and, and understanding on our, our side, great respect for the, the work which you do. And uh, I've read your, your, your book, and, and it's a fascinating study, and, and uh, uh, a very interesting argument about where we are and where we may go. Thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come back to Dublin. As you said, I was here in 2012 talking about the financial crisis in Europe and the impact on the politics of European integration. And since then, many things have happened. And I've tried to make some sense of Europe's multiple crises in this book that was published by Oxford University Press in June this year, entitled In Defense of Europe, Can the European Project Be Saved? The trouble with that book in the UK was that the book came out only shortly before the UK referendum, and then everything was hijacked by Brexit. Nobody cares about the European project since the British have decided to walk out of it. So who cares? So where I'm talking about the European project in the rest of Europe. Now, two th questions I would like to address today, briefly. One is about what's gone wrong with Europe and the European project in recent years, and many things have clearly gone wrong. If you compare, for example, the state of euphoria that was prevailing in Europe around the turn of the century, when European political led leaders seem to be determined to change pretty radically the political and economic map of Europe, through the adoption of a single currency, a, co a European constitution, and the extension of Pax Europea to the rest of the European continent, to the state of, without exaggeration, of doom and gloom that's been prevailing in Brussels and elsewhere in Europe in recent years. And then, second part of the talk, try not so much to talk about what can be done to save it, but talk about some of the main policy challenges and choices facing us in the months and years ahead. Now, everybody's talking about Europe's multiple crises. There have been several of them in recent years. But one of my main arguments is that there are important long-term underlying trends that have been sapping the capacity of the European system to deal with problems. And one of them is overstretch. I have become increasingly convinced that the European system suffers from overstretch. And this overstretch is the result of an ever-expanding European project in terms of membership of functions, which has been going on for 50 odd years, but combined. So it's the expansion of functions of membership is not bad in itself. But if you continue to keep on expanding functions of membership, while the center remains weak and the legitimacy base on which the whole project rests remains weak as well, then you've got a problem. And by the way, parenthesis, think about all those studies about Europeanization. The idea was that with successive enlargements, uh, countries would gradually converge in terms of standards, institutions, rules, and converge towards uh, the higher benchmark provided by the more developed countries of Western Europe. Now, experience suggests that Europeanization moves extremely slowly, if at all, in some cases. Now, and then that, but that particular long-term underlying trend is specific to Europe. There's something else which is much broader than Europe. And this is that Europe and the European project runs the risk 
of being a victim of collateral damage. Collateral damage which is related to the latest stage of global capitalism that has two important characteristics. If you think of what has been happening in the last 20, 25 years, slow growth on average and widening income inequalities within countries. So it's a combination of two things. Western economies, the European economy in general, has been growing at a much slower pace for the last 20 years, and while inequalities have been rising inside our member countries. If I were to summarize the history of European integration, history of the last 50 or 60 years, this is the way I would summarize it. Uh, the European integration has become, or the European project has become ever bigger, more intrusive, and less inclusive in a steadily deteriorating economic environment. And that is not good news. But Europe has been faced with multiple crises in recent years. Of course, the one that is most obvious and very familiar to you in Ireland is the Eurozone crisis. Interesting question, the first question to ask, and I think the answer is pretty obvious, is how is it that an international financial crisis that originates in the United States turns into an existential crisis of the Eurozone and European integration in general? And of course, I think the answer lies with a very poor design. The Euro is for me an extreme example of European overstretch, but more than that, it was a decision to proceed with the creation of a common currency without being willing to accept the consequences in terms of institutions and common instruments. So it was some Europeans thought that they could have a currency without any form of advanced fiscal or political union. And I believe that in the medium and long term, this is an unsustainable proposition. And they paid the price when the crisis came. Europeans were unlucky because the first big test for their young currency coincided with the biggest, with the bursting of the biggest international financial bubble since 1929, and that's bad luck. So they were both unprepared and they were also unlucky, and then they proceeded with wrong policies. Of course, this is a very long story. The way I would summarize it, first of all, Europe has been in a state of denial about the banking problem that broke out of the Eurozone crisis for a long time. We still have a banking problem in several European countries. And it also adopted a wrong policy mix, insisting on austerity rules. Remember, there are more and more rules in the government of the Eurozone. Those rules are increasingly pronounced with a rolling R, like in German. Uh, but this emphasis on austerity was largely based on a narrative about the crisis, that the crisis was essentially the result of irresponsible fiscal policies and large deficits, which is true of Greece, but it was not true of Ireland, it was not true of Spain, it was not true of many other European countries. You had a private bubble, we in Greece had a public bubble. Uh, now, many things have happened since the outbreak of the crisis, uh, but still we continue with a clash of interests and a clash of different narratives. And a good question to ask, to which there's no simple answer, is to what extent this incompatibility of views and policies reflects different interests, or is it an ideological dialogue of the deaf? But in many cases, interests and ideology overlap. And despite all the changes and the new rules that have been introduced in the management of the Eurozone, the ECB essentially remains the only actor of last resort. And this is the only actor of last resort that keeps the system ticking at the present moment. But, of course, the Eurozone crisis is not the only crisis that Europe has experienced. In the meantime, the neighborhood, or a large part of Europe's neighborhood, has caught fire. <coughs> And remember, if you look at the map, I know you in Ireland are much more protected because your only neighbors are, you only have the British and the sea to cope with. Uh, in other parts of Europe, it's much more complicated. Uh, 
Uh, if you look at the map, Europe is surrounded by a wide arc of instability, starting from Ukraine down to Moldova and Georgia, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Algeria, and further to the east, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, not to mention parts of Africa. It is a neighborhood that is very unstable, is unlikely to stabilize anytime soon, and it's a neighborhood that is not very easy for Europeans to deal with, and it's a, neighbor, a neighborhood that is exporting instability to Europe, and it is exporting instability through the export of refugees, immigrants, and also terrorists. I'm not suggesting that refugees are terrorists, but there are three different categories. But one thing, apart from the export of instability, one thing that we have learned or rather, one illusion that has been shattered as a result of the crisis is the illusion of Europe's soft power in international politics. Hard power has come back with a vengeance, and Europe is extremely weak. And there are two things mainly in the neighborhood that convinced us that Europe's neighbor soft power was an illusion. One was the failure of the Arab Spring and wars, civil wars, and all the rest in the Arab world. Plus, Mr. Putin reminded us that Europe's soft power was not exactly a credible proposition. But one other thing that's happened is that because of the crisis, a new balance of power has emerged in Europe. And I'm saying the obvious here. We have the emergence of an undisputed, yet unhappy and very reluctant leader in Germany. The progressive weakening of countries such as France and Italy, and an increasing number of free riders, misfits, and laggards inside the European Union. So a combination of one reluctant and unhappy leader with many free riders, misfits, and laggards leads to the proposition with a question mark, whether Europe is governable in the foreseeable future. So are we faced with an ungovernable postmodern European empire? Now, a few words about Brexit. I'm sure you know about Brexit more, although I've spent, I spent about 25 years of my life in Britain, but you are more directly affected by Brexit than us on the other side of Europe. But perhaps just two or three comments about Brexit. No doubt, Brexit is a result of a huge act of political irresponsibility uh, on behalf of Mr. Cameron. But not only. If you think about it, Mr. Farage is the one who almost single-handedly delivered Brexit for the British population, which is extraordinary. But now we have Mr. Trump, so nothing to worry about. Uh, I believe that the referendum of 23rd June reflects English peculiarities together with a much more general European phenomenon. And here I borrow a phrase from a Scottish friend of mine who says that Brexit was won by an unholy alliance of members of English golf clubs, those people who are nostalgic of the British Empire and who live in the English countryside, with the sans-culotte, the losers from globalization. And it is a very interesting and a very unholy alliance. To some extent, there are interesting comparisons to draw with what happened in the United States with the election of Mr. Trump. They elected a billionaire, and many of the losers of globalization felt that the billionaire will save them from the effects of globalization. But there's another point I would like to make, and this is that it's about free movement of labor, free movement of people. Uh, I think it's pretty clear from surveys that the most important determining factor on Brexit was free movement. Uh, 
the British voted against immigration. They voted in favor of restoration of control over borders. And I have been saying that even before the referendum, that I think it was a huge mistake on behalf of the rest of us that we did not give more to an otherwise, if I may say so, irresponsible Mr. Cameron on this subject. Free movement of labor, free movement of people, is one of the sacred cows of European integration. It's part of the four fundamental freedoms, it's part of the single market. But free movement of people was fine as long as Europe was a fairly homogeneous group in economic terms, growth was healthy, and not many people moved. In a new world of huge economic diversity and heterogeneity in Europe, coupled with very slow growth and a great, much greater willingness of people to move, I believe that we may need thresholds and safety valves, even inside the European Union. And I know every time I say that, especially in Brussels, people shiver with horror because it is really challenging one of the holy things of the, Bi the European Bible. But my point of view is that if freedom of movement is a sacred cow, this sacred cow will need to become leaner in order to avoid ritual sacrifice in times of crisis. Now, looking into the future, just raise a few questions and then we'll have, we can, I hope, We'll, I have provoked you sufficiently to have some discussion, although I know that it's never difficult to provoke Irish people to have a discussion. Uh, um, now, looking into the future. If slow growth combined with persisting wide inequalities inside countries persists, this is going to be a ticking bomb for our political systems in Europe. I know you are doing better than the average European country in terms of growth, but for Europe as a whole, this is a huge problem. All predictions point to pretty low growth for the foreseeable future. People talk about secular stagnation. Madame Lagarde talks about the new mediocre. If those predictions materialize, and we have persistence of slow growth combined with widening income inequalities, the future looks very gloomy to me and dangerous politically. Uh, now, question of course is how do you restore growth, but how also do you achieve the objective of inclusive societies? And one provocative question that I have to put to you is that it is the following. Are there signs to indicate that on many instances there may be a trade-off between competitiveness and internal cohesion for countries? And if such a trade-off exists between competitiveness and equity inside countries, how will political parties cope with that? Even worse, how will social democratic parties in Europe cope with such a trade-off? I don't have a simple answer. But one reason I believe that social democrats across Europe are doing so badly is precisely because they have no answer to that problem. Now, Eurozone remains dysfunctional despite many changes in European governance. The Eurozone is neither effective nor legitimate. And I believe that the biggest systemic risk for the Eurozone today is Italy, not Greece. Not because it, uh, Greece is doing well, but because Greece is small enough and now sufficiently insulated in order not to present a systemic risk to the rest of the Eurozone. Italy is the big systemic risk because Italy is a country that is too big to fail and too big to save. And remember that in Italy today, which is completely unprecedented, virtually all opposition parties are against the Euro, against continued membership of the Euro, and they are turning increasingly Eurosceptic. 
The fact that Italy is turning increasingly Eurosceptic, I think tells us a lot about how Italy has changed, but also how European integration has changed. Uh, next point, I know it's very sensitive when one raises questions of taxation in this country. I believe that, and I will be blunt and perhaps provocative, I believe that a single market and a monetary union is simply incompatible with independent national taxation policies, especially with reference to the most mobile factor, which is capital. And something has to give in. And we know from experience that the combination of the abolition of national borders and the abolition of the exchange risk and independent tax policies on capital have turned tax avoidance and tax evasion for multinationals into cottage industry. And we have more experience of that in recent years. And I believe that this has become and will continue to be one of the big political issues on the agenda of Europe. And the pressure to agree not on tax harmonization, but on minimum rates and common standards will increase because of this experience and also because the British are leaving. And the British have been one of the main obstacles to progress in that respect, although I know that this is not meant to be progress in Ireland. But I believe that the next phase of integration, if any, will require more differentiation within Europe uh, and search for a new place for the UK, but not only the UK, because there may be need to find a place for other countries in Europe that may not want to be members of the more integrated core, which for the time being is identified with membership of the Eurozone. So the next phase will require much more differentiation than we've had. And then the, second, the next question is about security. Security, both internal and external, is reaching again the top of the agenda. Europe operated on two implicit assumptions for years. One was that soft power counted, number one. And number two, that Europe could rely on the cheap on the protection of the United States. I think both of those assumptions are certainly much less valid, and this is, to put it mildly, than they were before. Is Europe ready for adult life in terms of security? I have my doubts. In general, people say that you know, the challenges are huge. Europe will not be able to deal with them. But then my counter question is, or rather counter proposition is, if it is true that Europe is not able, will not be able to cope with those challenges, then what is the likely consequence? And the likely consequence is of an increasingly weak, divided, and increasingly irrelevant Europe in a rapidly changing world. And you might argue that uh, relative decline for a prosperous continent is not necessarily a very bad thing. It may not be a very bad thing for people of my age, you know, declining graciously with grace may not be that bad if you are over 50, but I'm not sure this is a proposition that can be very credible for the younger generations. And I'm not even sure that Europe's neighborhood and Mr. Putin will allow us to decline in grace. 